Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Lloyd Thomas and I'm here today to talk to you about my experience of treating my son's autism for eight years with bumetanide. Uh, first, I should point out that I'm not a doctor. Um, I do have a lot of scientific training, but it wasn't in medicine. I come from a family of doctors, uh, both parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, nephews, nieces. They're all doctors and they were all taught that autism is untreatable. I discovered in 2012 that my son's autism does respond to drug therapy. And then I want him to develop a personalized polytherapy uh, to treat my son's specific type of autism. And I share this uh, online by my blog, Epiphany ASD. First of all, it's important to know what type of autism we're talking about today. I'm talking about severe autism, which you might also known as Kaner's autism, DSM-3 autism. We're not talking about mild autism. Um, bumetanide may well be effective for that as well, but I'm talking about severe autism. Um, so life prior to bumetanide. So my son was born in um, 2003, very healthy baby. He was large, muscular. Um, that actually wasn't a good thing, but um, he was clearly a little bit different from birth. Um, he went to school, kindergarten, quite young, but very soon we were told we had to provide a one-to-one -one assistant because his behavior was disruptive. Then when he was three and a half, he was still non-verbal non and he was diagnosed with autism. We then started an intensive home program using ABA and PECS, and this was year round. Um, he went to school, but no real learning was possible prior to taking bumetanide. He learned at home with his one-to-one -one assistant, who was really amazing. Unfortunately, when he was aged eight, the amazing assistant left, and this prompted an so emotional crisis and a severe regression, both cognitive and behavioral. He became violent towards others, violent towards himself, uh, and this went on for nine months, so quite a grim period. And of course, some people have this uh, their entire life. Um, in 2012, in December, we started bumetanide treatment. And this was prompted by coming across um, an article which led me to this paper, a randomized controlled trial of bumetanide in the treatment of autism. Now, this was my first medical paper um, I've read many hundreds, if not thousands, since then. And my advice to all parents is don't be intimidated. Take control. Read the research yourself. Much of it is written by psychiatrists, if, if it's to do with clinical trials. It's not so complicated. And you will learn quite soon thereafter that many researchers and most Dan doctors are not as clever as you might think. So take control, don't rely on other people to do this work for you. So what really grabbed my attention was this chart, which shows the effect on the childhood autism rating scale called CARS. If your CARS score is above 30, then you have autism. It's a, if it's above 37, you have severe autism. And in this small trial, the average score at day zero when they started was almost 42, so really severe autism. And after 90 days of bumetanide, that had fallen to 36. That's a dr dramatic drop because if it dropped another six, you'd lose your diagnosis of autism. So it's a really substantial uh, drop. And then the next issue for following on from that is how much proof do you need? Because if you have a, a study like that showing that bumetanide clearly is effective, why not just start with your therapy, which of course this is what I did. But um, conventional wisdom is that you must wait, but unfortunately you may have to wait for 10 or 15 years. Now, what happens if you choose to wait those 10, 15 years? Then you're exposed to the natural course of autism, which is the risk of doing nothing. Now in this chart here, you'll see it's a result from a, a longitudinal study in France where they followed small children into adulthood. And it showed that in their group of children from all across France, 80% of those diagnosed would have been in the 90s, mid 90s with autism. 80% had 
at the age of 22, they have the daily living skills of a three-year-old, which is not a very attractive prospect. 20% actually do quite well, and that's the high growth group, and they end up with daily living skills of a 15-year-old, which really isn't bad. You can live quite well with those skills. So anyway, I started my N equals one trial, because I'm just trialing it on my son. I started discussing safety issues with my doctor relatives and my son's pediatrician. And the conclusion was there really are no safety issues as long as you are um, careful with potassium levels. So you have to measure the blood potassium level before you start to see the baseline. Then I commenced treatment one milligram once a day, starting December 2012. Now we use a, a dose of two milligrams once a day. By giving um, potassium supplement and a banana a day, uh, potassium levels stayed in the normal period. So after 10 days of starting the trial, you really want to check potassium again, because in a small number of people, potassium levels can fall substantially. Then you might have to use a larger supplement. Another issue is that you have to avoid dehydration because bumetanide will cause a lot of diuresis. And hopefully the child will naturally compensate by drinking more water, as was the case for my son. Now, when we, we went away at Christmas and then we came back to school in January and I was pulled aside by the head of the primary school. And I thought, oh dear, what's happened now? What's Monty done? But no, it was actually good news. And she came and said, Peter, what's happened to your son? You know, he's so joyful. It might have even been joyous. It was a really unusual word to hear. Uh, so what she'd noticed wasn't his cognitive gains. It was his general mood and behavior. And uh, one of his classmates came to our house and I said to her, you know, have you noticed anything about Monty? And she said, he's different, but in a good way. So that was nice. So he, his personality changed, but it was a good change. Uh, in terms of cognition, it's more a case of the fog had lifted and Monty was finally present. So before he'd been present in body alone, not really with his mental capacity. And a good example of that is how he responded to this question, which I ask him every day and have done since he was able to talk. I asked him what he had for lunch at school today because it's a question that I always know the answer to when I ask it. And in the past, he would either ignore the question or would just make up an answer like pizza, just any random word. But all of a sudden he started giving me detailed breakdown of what he had for lunch. So chicken with peas and carrots and peas, dessert was cake. And it was given with real sort of gusto, like he really wanted to tell me with some sort of passion which was totally new. There were important changes to learning. Uh, for four years, I had been trying to teach my son about prepositions. And I have lots of ways of doing this. I even had computer software to help me. So you put the apple on the table, or put the apple under the table, or you put the apple beside the table. Uh, but for my son, the only words that mattered were apple and table, whether it was above, below, on, beside, those words were totally meaningless to him. Uh, very soon after starting Bumetanide, he learned the prepositions all by himself. Um, we have been using ABA and there's this uh, assessment of basic language and learning skills called ABLES. And this is a long list of skills that you want your child to learn. And in a typical child, they will learn these skills by the time they're about three years old. And my son was nine years old and there were still big gaps. Uh, and then he filled these gaps in himself. He just learnt like a typical, like a normal child would. This was also very evident when it came to maths because we hadn't been able to attend the maths classes at school because he couldn't understand any of the concepts, bigger, smaller. You, you can't use the number line. You can't subtract you know, nine minus two and get seven if you don't understand the order the numbers come in. So he went from being uh, hopeless at maths, no knowledge whatsoever, to it now being his best subject. And he gets good grades at school in maths. 
And I just had a parent teacher meeting with the maths teacher. She was telling me how good he is. And I said, do you realize at the age of nine, he couldn't subtract single digit numbers, which was a shock to her. Uh, piano playing, it improved from him hitting the teacher to him becoming the teacher's most improved pupil. And he was even able to give a recital in public, um, not with special needs kids, with typical kids. And even better example is that he's still in his original mainstream school because this school doesn't accept uh, children with special needs and um, they have no capacity for it. So he attends mainstream, mainstream school with no IEP. He does the same tests as everyone else and he doesn't come bottom in any of the subjects. So he's like an average learner. There are some other important points that I'd like to highlight. Um, the first really is that not everyone is going to respond to bimetanide. Um, certain types of autism, um, it looks like autism secondary to mitochondrial disease, autism caused by hypoxia during birth, agenesis of the corpus callosum, those people may not get a benefit from bimetanide. But for many people with severe autism, and with an IQ uh, well below 70, they can expect to see a substantial increase in measured IQ. I would think it's something like 30 or 40 points. It's a major, major important improvement. It's not trivial at all. Uh, the research um, supports the use of bimetanide in Down syndrome, uh, girls with Rett syndrome, and boys with fragile X. So I think it is very well worthwhile asking your doctor to let you uh, trial bumetanide. Now, bumetanide is only partially effective because it very poorly crosses the blood-brain barrier, and hopefully uh, there will be a better drug uh, developed. Um, but at the moment, bumetanide is really what we've got. If you trial bumetanide in your child using a low dose, like half a milligram, it's very likely that bumetanide has no effect whatsoever. Now, that doesn't mean your child did not is not a bumetanide responder. It just means the dose is too small. Another uh, point which I learned is that um, bumetanide can appear to stop working if there's a chronic inflammatory condition, like a, um, in my son's case, um, pollen allergy. And what happens is the uh, expression of NKCC1 to KCC2 changes when there's inflammation. And this change will negate the benefit that bumetanide is providing. And then the drug will appear not to work. So what you have to do is treat the inflammatory condition. So in my son's case with mast cell stabilizers, increase the dose of bumetanide, and then you'll see the effect of bumetanide coming back again. So what does life look like after eight years of bumetanide? Well, my son is now 17 years old. He's very diligent at school. He's very well included. His teachers like him, classmates like him. He's still autistic, but substantially less so. There's no self-injury or regression. He does the same tests, academic tests, as his peers. He gets average grades, as do most of his peers. His expressive language is limited. He's not a chatty person but he's quite capable of speaking. He's, um, he has very good handwriting, which is unusual in autism. He's good at spelling. He's good at mental maths. When it comes to physical activities, which were difficult when he was young, he now skis on black slopes, which are the steepest ones, rides a bike. He still plays piano. He's a very, co very competent swimmer. He swims really fast. And all of this has led to us be able to take him on holidays all around the world. And last year, we had, we were, had to fly from Beijing in China home, to come home. We had to get up at three o'clock in the morning, go to the airport, and we had to change planes in Switzerland and then fly home. Now, that was no problem at all. And neither is going through the, the having your fingerprinting done in China, facial recognition, all these things that might um, cause a problem in someone with severe autism, they, they cease to become issues.
When it comes to side effects um, from this therapy, um, every, all, all the lab results come out normal. Liver enzymes, electrolytes. Um, we even did the echocardiogram, which is the ultrasound of the heart. So everything is normal. There was no onset of epilepsy. Now, which is common around puberty. I can't prove that's due to this therapy, but it might be. And of course, my son is star of the uh, Epiphany ASD science blog. So for me, it's a case of mission accomplished. I didn't set out to create a neurotypical child because that was never going to be possible. But I wanted to have a child who was able to participate and be included with um, his peers. So even with ABA, my son, LT, uh, he was acquiring new skills, but he wasn't acquiring new skills at the rate, same rate as the typical children. So as he got older, the more behind he would fall. So what I did was when he was nine years old, I put him back two years in school. So I changed his peer group. And then from the age of nine to the age of 17, he's moved forward every year at the same pace as his peers. And he's still able to keep up, which has surprised all the teachers. Another important point is, how do I know um, that bumetanide still works? Why am I still giving him the pills? Well, on several occasions, I've made withdrawal trials, so stopping giving the bumetanide. And you can see a gradual loss of cognition so simple mathematical tasks that have been mastered again become impossible. Some people do stop the metanide after a few years um, and they think there's no difference, but I'm not sure how much they work with their child because you really have to know your child and you know, sit down with him, be teaching him you know, math, simultaneous equations, um, trigonometry. And then you'll notice if something which he could do, he somehow has lost knowledge of. Um, so when I stop all of the therapy, um, then I get stereotypy, uh, sound sensitivity, lethargy, and self-injury in summer. They all come back. So what I learned was that you need multiple therapies, and um, these are probably lifelong therapies that you need. So to end my talk, I think the takeaway message is that uh, trialing bumetanide might be the best decision you ever made. It certainly was the best decision I ever made in my life. A very simple decision, no negative consequences, but many positive con consequences. Now, if you want to read further about the practicalities of using it, I'd suggest you read the publication um, at the bottom of the slide which you can find via Google. So the safe use of bumetanide in children with autism, written by a doctor, not me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur. And uh, thank you. A lot uh, of things which you presented are pretty much like uh, uh, eye opener for many of the physicians like me. Uh, however, I have much of um, questions asked by uh, the attendees. And uh, I will read one by one. I'm taking um, note of the questions, folks. And if you have more questions, please do um, you know, ask uh, questions uh, from Arthur's expertise. So Arthur, I'm going to combine two questions that I received and both have to do with the potassium uh, modulation. And the first question uh, which was asked was, have patients required potassium supplementation while taking bimetanide? If yes, which type? And the second part of the question is, any experience with other potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone? Yes, um, spironolactone, spironolactone is actually a very good idea because not only is it raising the level of potassium, but it also reduces male hormones. So you may get a secondary benefit via uh, raw alpha which is another central point um, in some autism. But for most parents, they're just concerned about what potassium supplement to buy. I use potassium citrate, but really you can use any supplement. The unusual thing is that in the United States, 
um, these supplements are limited to 100 milligrams, whereas um, in the rest of the world, they're not. So I use 250 milligrams per one milligram of bromatinide. But you can use whatever's available where you live. But a banana, which contains about 700 milligrams, is a good idea. You have to note that when you, when you eat um, potassium in food, it's very slowly absorbed. When you take a supplement, you get a sharp spike in potassium. That's why in the States it's restricted. So eat bananas or other fruit containing potassium, and if necessary, add a small supplement. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter, for answering that question. And I apologize uh, addressing you as author because, you know, I have been given fabulous uh, speakers that I have to introduce. And uh, Dr. Krigsman says next, but Peter, uh, this, the next question which was asked was, did your son have any history of abnormal mitochondrial labs? Uh, to be totally honest, that I've never tested them, so I, I wouldn't know. Um, I, my approach to treating autism was very basic. Um, I just looked at core, um, core elements of the research, and that, that sent me in the, in the direction I, I needed to go. There are many mitochondrial tests, um, but people, the, the good one is taking a biopsy of muscle, which nobody does because they don't, it's invasive. Uh, that is the best test. And I think the other tests that he used are not necessarily re reliable. But um, I don't think that would put, put you off either way. People with, um, a lot of these tests say that almost all children have mitochondrial dysfunction of some kind. I think if in severe autism, almost 50% of people will respond to bumetanide. So you have a very good chance of uh, success. Perfect. Um, the next question uh, which was asked was, uh, what other treatments are you looking at next for addressing the residual symptoms of ASD in your son, which he might still have? Right, well, in my, in my son, I pretty much address the cognitive issue. So he's gone from being at low IQ to being fully functional. He can do complicated maths um, and he doesn't have self-injury. He doesn't have stereotypy, but his expressive language is limited. He, he can talk, he can sing, but he doesn't, he doesn't spontaneously communicate. Um, and uh, uh, calcium folinate, uh, Dr. Fry and Dr. Ramaker's um, idea, that does make my son significantly increase his speech, but it makes him aggressive. That's the downside. So I aim to increase speech without having any aggression. Excellent, excellent. Thanks for letting us know. Now, um, very interesting question. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the magic pill that wipes out autism symptoms and one being a usual pill that many people are trying, how will you score improvement with bumetanide in your case? Well, bumetanide is the most potent of all the therapies I use. That's, that's clear. But all it does is it convinces you that it's possible to treat autism. Because when you see that one pill having such a strong effect, you then say, okay, what else can I do? And this is what started my journey. So bumetanide is the most effective, but I very quickly added two more. I mean, literally within about three weeks, starting, I read the research, I thought, well, N-acetylcysteine, NAC, the antioxidant. Amazing effect from the first pill. And it has in many other, in many other children, but the research, because you have uh, Dr. Harden later, I think, it was his research from 2013, that's what I read. But it hasn't really caught on. Well, why aren't all people taking bumetanide? Why aren't all people taking NAC? They're not. Right, right, excellent. Um, Peter, the next uh, question which was asked, I think it's more of a comment and uh, possibly your opinion on the comment. Um, so the, it, it, the message is, Peter, as a parent who has learned so much from your blog over years, uh, thank you so much for incredible work do you do. Also, thank you for sharing your personal story. Given the desperate need of the, for the treatment, that bimetonide is well-known drug with benign safety profile that you can easily prevent like dehydrations, hypokalemia. What is holding physicians from um, using this as off-label uh, prescribing drug? 
Well, it's a very good point. And I would contrast that to what's happening now with COVID because in COVID we have emergency authorization of novel vaccines for very good reasons, because people are dying. So when we have safe drugs that have been approved for 40 years, why aren't they used and applied in autism? Because it's not seen as an emergency. And this is the, this is the big problem that for me it is an emergency because it's my son, but for the regulator it's not an emergency. And this is, this is the, the big um, uh, problem for the European Medical um, Association, for the FDA, autism is not an emergency. If you have a child with autism, it's your emergency. That, that's the problem. Got it. And uh, I think uh, I have one more question for you. Would you say in your son's case, the most benefit you noticed was in the area of cognition? If so, is this also what others may have observed? Um, the interesting thing, and with all intervention in autism, every single one, is different people see completely different benefits. So in my son, because I'm teaching him, because I, I've been teaching him for uh, you know, 15 years, I see the cognitive changes. If you just casually meet him, you, you notice that he recognized you and he greets you. So you, you notice that. So um, there are multiple benefits. Um, but for me, uh, it, with an autistic child, without cognition, you can do nothing. How can you learn to brush your teeth? How can you tie your shoelaces? How can you be toilet trained? Um, so cognition is the key. There are other, other um, therapies hidden in the literature which also help improve cognition. So bumetanide is not the only one. There are some completely different ones that um, have been rather forgotten about. Um, but cognition is the main thing I looked at. Perfect. Peter, I have a few more questions. And um, the next one is, is there a particular subtype or genetic mutations that might help by bimetanide? Um, the reality is, if you're talking about severe autism, you've got a 50% chance of it working. So just try it. I mean, I, it, it, there's no point because you might find in one person with Down syndrome, it works, in the next, it doesn't. Uh, but try it because if you, if you have Down syndrome, your IQ is less than 70. Your whole life is going to be ahead of you. It's really going to be very, very tough. So this pill, well, I mean, where I live, this pill costs me $3 a pack. It's, so it costs nothing, basically. So what you need to do is go to your doctor, show him the research, whatever you need to say, right, I really want to try this. I need to try it for at least a month. And even, even if you have a genetic autism, which no one has thought about in the literature, there's no harm in trying it. Because according to um, Dr. Benari, this um, uh, elevated chloride is a function, is a feature of most autism and also uh, Parkinson's, you know, your granddad with Parkinson's disease, you'd think, how can he have immature neurons? The research says he does. So everyone, I mean, everyone, um, there's no point spending thousands of dollars in genetic testing when you don't want to spend $3 on a little trial of autism, a trial of bometanide. Agreed. Totally agree. Um, Next question is, how long was Monty on one milligram of bimetanide before you increased it to dose of two milligrams? Um, what happened was after about um, three years, we started to get self-injury self in summer. And, and this is when bumetanide appeared not to work. So this was triggered actually by an allergy, it's po a pollen allergy. So as part of solving the why bumetanide stopped working, I doubled the dose. And also then I treated the allergy with mast cell stabilizers. So about three years. And there, were, there was no significant increase in diuresis. Um, and um, ideally I would give him two milligrams twice a day. The problem is uh, it's impractical. 